Everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. I'm Emily Moyer. Randy is not here today. He's sick. He's not feeling well, so he apologizes, and we hope he feels better soon. And um, we're going to get right into it here. So I have a very special edition of Off Planet Radio for you guys today, kind of a joint conversation for our listeners as well as our guest's website. Our guest probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to give her a, a little one anyway. She is well known and loved for her research and presentations on chemtrails, Morgellons, and an ever-growing list of topics. But my favorite thing about her is that she is not afraid to step away from the research and play what if, and she plays it better than anybody. She's here today to help me navigate some new rabbit holes and dig out the tunnels connecting them to the ones we are already so familiar with. Her website is aboutthesky.com. There is nobody I'd rather go rabbit hole diving with than Sophia Smallstorm. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Emily, wow. I, you know, I wrote that down when you said to me that um, about going rabbit hole diving with me. And I read it from my little index card on my desk many times since we last talked. And it just makes me smile. And yeah, I want to go rabbit hole diving with you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I've been really looking forward to this. And just so everyone knows, it's kind of unusual the way this show came together. Um, Usually when we have someone on, we have them on to talk about a topic that they're really well known for talking about. But I've had a topic that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. And I was looking for somebody to talk about it with and having trouble finding somebody who I thought was qualified or who, who wanted to talk about it on the air. And then I heard Sophia talking about a related topic and I'm like, wow, should I ask her? And I didn't, I didn't know her at the time, so I was a little nervous to ask her, but I went for it and asked her, and she has kindly obliged. So today, we will be um, digging into a couple, kind of a, it'll be kind of a wide conversation, but we're going to start with this idea of CrossFit as a cult. CrossFit is this exercise phenomenon that has become extremely popular, and um, the more I look at it, and I've, I've tried it, and the more I look at it, I've there's some things in there that are very concerning and I brought the topic up to Sophia and she thought it sounded interesting as well. And I had heard her speak with um, Sage of Quay about rhabdomyolysis, which is a medical condition, which a lot of people have suffered because of their participation in CrossFit. And so when I heard her talking about that, I thought, okay, this will be good to talk about it with her. So we're going to start there uh, in, you know, in the first hour and then we will sort of, however we end up there, get kind of weighed through um, the topic of what Sophia has been called, terming the club that she's been talking about. And I'll let her explain that as we get into it. And then we're going to wind our way into a conversation about um, MK Ultra athletes and the possibility of genetic alteration, moderation, engineering, and mind control in some of the athletes we're seeing in the Olympics and in professional sports. So we're going to start with that. So Sophia, why don't you want, if you do want to start with kind of like letting people know what rhabdomyolysis is and why you sort of got into that topic and then we'll move to there. We'll move into the uh, CrossFit as a cult from there. Sure. For a while I was um, noticing um, some large, I don't know what they were made of, but call them figures on display in a window in a building in Solana Beach, California, which I learned later was the CrossFit corporate headquarters. It was the legal department as well. And I had seen CrossFit gyms here and there, but I didn't know anything about it. And this, these figurines, there were three of them. They were garish, very large. They were muscular clown looking things with uh, red hair. Uh, very sculpted, and um, I found out when I Googled CrossFit that this was their um, mascot, and they called it Uncle Rabdo. And Rabdo is a truncation of the term rhabdomyolysis, which is a very horrible disease that um, strikes people whose muscle cells are failing. 
And apparently this is an issue when you join CrossFit and allow yourself to be pushed in training beyond your limits. And this is the whole um, philosophy of, of CrossFit, that you will super train. You will train to the point of puking, of falling down. You have to be a super, super performer, even in the gym, in a gym session. And um, Uncle Rabdo, the mascot, has traditionally, they don't uh, depict him this way in those uh, displays that I saw, but he's got, he's standing in a pool of blood with his guts spilled at his feet, and sometimes he's hooked up to a dialysis machine. Now, this is pretty horrific. Um, you can find cartoons of Uncle Rabdo online and that you will see the guts and the blood and the yuck. And uh, what I found out about this rhabdomyolysis was that in the type of training they teach at CrossFit, it's partner-based training. So you'll go and you'll meet up with your partner, who's probably a friend of yours, and you'll do sets of uh, exercises. For instance, let's just pretend you're doing biceps or triceps exercises. And you do one set, your partner does one set, you do one set, your partner does one set, and you keep going, and neither of you wants to be outdone by the other. So this is what compels you to push past your limits. And what happens in our cellular biology is that when muscle cells tire, they will stop making their energy in the nucleus, which is called respiration, and they will go into fermentation which means they're using the cytoplasm, which is the part of the cell surrounding the nucleus, and they're using glucose and making energy out of that. And um, that's called anaerobic uh, energy production. And everyone has experienced this. When you go for a, a run, or you happen to have to run for some reason or other, um, or you're doing some you know, work with your muscles, and you get to the point where you feel a burning sensation, that means your muscles have switched over from respiration, aerobic respiration energy making to anaerobic energy making, and they're actually running out of fuel. And this is why you have to stop. So when you run very fast to the point of you can't run anymore, your body is telling you, hey, I gotta rest because I can't keep doing this at this pace. So in CrossFit, they push you beyond that indication that your body is giving you, that message point. They push you into complete failure and fatigue. And this can result in you going to the hospital with a case of this rhabdomyolysis. And I can explain that more, but rhabdo is a very serious condition and people often don't survive it. It's a form of blood poisoning that taxes the kidneys because the muscle cells, their membranes have now broken and the myoglobin, which is a protein inside muscle cells, has spilled into the blood and bl the bloodstream does not tolerate myoglobin in it. And what you end, if you survive CrossFit, most often, I shouldn't have said that, if you survive <coughs> that though, most often you may end up with an absolute loss of power in that muscle group. So there are people who have joined CrossFit, brought themselves into rhabdo, and then ended up with jelly-like triceps or biceps or muscle areas that don't even function anymore for the rest of their lives. You can end up in a wheelchair. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's kind of, I mean, I, I was... I wasn't familiar with the term rhabdomyolysis until I heard you speaking about it. And that's sort of the extreme end of it, sort of um, where my concern came from. You know, what happened for me is I was out for a walk one day with my mother several years ago, and we passed by um, a place that said CrossFit rep scheme. And I thought, I've heard of the CrossFit thing. I didn't know too much about it. I went in there, talked to the lady and um, signed up to come back the next week and take a, a free trial. And I was a little out of shape for myself during this period of time, but I was a competitive gymnast, competed in NC2A. And so for me, even when I'm out of shape for myself, it's generally more fit than most people are. And, you know, coming from gymnastics, a lot of the 
training methods in terms of like, you know, pushing yourself to exhaustion and then a little bit farther is something I'm familiar with. And obviously something that would sort of at least, you know, seem natural to me or that I even might like. Um, and so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try this. Um, and so I went and um, I, I it, it was a very interesting, um, it, there was about 25, 20 or 25 people in the class. And it's, yeah, you're moving, it, it was sort of more of a group thing. You did have sort of a partner, but it was more like a group thing. And you kind of go from station to station and do, you know, all these different, you know, push-ups, pull-ups, things with weights, jumping up on a box, jumping down. And these were all things that I was familiar with from my training as a gymnast. What I found shocking was that nobody was using any kind of form or technique. And it was just about go, go, go as many as you can. I didn't hear one person comment on anyone's form or technique the whole time. And when I would, at a certain point, I mean, I, I was, you know, slow. I understand like what is a reasonable space to push myself to and then maybe a little bit further. But like, as soon as there was any sign somebody was slowing down, they were kind of on you, keep going. And there is this sort of like group peer pressure. You don't want to be the slowest or the last or anything like that. And this went on for an, like an hour and I was really tired at the end, but more I was like really concerned about like I had been doing things with bad form was I going to hurt myself and but it was definitely a good workout and there's things about that kind of thing that, that might appeal to me but I went home and I could not, I could not get out of bed for the rest of the week and I've endured some brutal workouts in my time as a gymnast and never had anything quite like that so needless to say I didn't you get a free week with this thing I didn't go back again and from that moment, this was several years back, I thought, God, that is dangerous. Um, but it was sort of at the beginning of when it was becoming popular, and I hadn't noticed so many people so obsessed with it yet. And then as I've been watching over the years, it become this sort of complete lifestyle for people um, where they're, uh, you know, I have several friends that I'm friends with in real life, but also people that I'm just sort of friends with on Facebook who are into it. And so I kind of, you know, see their posts about it. It becomes this full, like, it seems like a lot of them have given up anything, any other part of their life. They're, all their friends are from CrossFit. That's all they talk about. They all eat the same diet. They socialize together. They wear these silly looking outfits with socks up to their knees. The gyms are almost like, like you know, it's like, they're, they're cinder blocks. They're very basic and grubby, you know, grimy inside, but they're very expensive to be part of. They're all over the place and they have different names and they're almost like, they call them boxes. They're almost like teams or clubs and they have competitions where they compete against the other ones. And you can even watch these competitions all day long, every day on the online. And when I watch these competitions, even the technique that these people who are the best at it are using is terrible. Like I, I, like I coached gymnastics for a number of years, so I feel like I'm qualified to discuss what is a reasonable way to exercise and a reasonable level. And I'm just shocked. I, 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 I'm shocked that, it, that it's still going on to a certain extent, you know, but I see people behaving it, who are involved in it in almost a cult-like way where they're kind of the rest of the world almost doesn't exist and where they're really defensive. If anybody, you know, I, I did read a lot of articles while I was getting ready for the show, that, you know, people get really defensive, including the company itself, anytime they're criticized. And, I started to get really looking at this and go, what is going on here? There's something strange. So what do you think about that, Sophia? Well, you know, when you pointed out to me that it was a cult-like um, phenomenon, I found that very interesting. And I did some research into the person who founded CrossFit, Greg Glassman, who grew mm -hmm. up in the San Fernando Valley, not far from you, I believe. Yep. He was a child with polio. So he apparently did not have very strong legs and he developed tremendous upper body strength. He put some rings, gymnastic rings in his garage and he became the ring man. He was able to do all kinds of incredible acrobatics on these rings. And that made up for his very spindly legs, which he still has today. He has not got a lot of lower body strength. But I think it was this internal, um, push that Glassman developed to excel and make up for the fact that he was very weak in part of his body. 
But he says now, first of all, CrossFit is the fastest growing gym chain in, I think it's the world. The world, yeah. Yep. They said, I, I read that there's five or six of them opening a day. Yeah, everybody's applying for franchises and they always get um, situated in these garage-like uh, enclosures. I, I found a CrossFit in an auto repair strip yep. mall where there was Goodyear tire and fender mender and those kinds of outfits. And then there's CrossFit. And they have the big, they, it used to be some kind of automotive garage and they had the big garage doors open. And I said, well, what happens when it's cold? He goes, you just have to start working out right away. The manager told me. Yeah. And he also let me know he was a little bit sheepish. But I asked him about Rabdo, and he said he had had it twice. I said, twice? Are you a fool? I mean, once is bad enough, but to let yourself have it two times? Yeah. And apparently he has recovered fully, which is very fortunate for him. But here's what Glassman has said in his interviews. He has said that CrossFit workouts can kill you. If you find the notion of falling off the rings and breaking your neck foreign to you, then we don't want you in our ranks. <laughs> wow. So this is kind of interesting to me. When you, I, I wasn't too familiar with him. When you brought him up, I, I've done a little looking into him. And yes, he's a gymnast like myself, and he's from the same area. So I'm going to, and you know, he's a little older than me, but not that much. So I'll go ahead and assume that at some point we probably at least crossed some of the same coaching paths, may have had some of the same coaches and whatnot. And here's where I want to draw, this is scary to me what he's saying, because um, I definitely at times in my gymnastics career pushed myself too far and was pushed too far. But that being said, by the time I, I that ever happened, I was already a very high level, well-trained athlete who was in excellent condition and who was using proper technique in the conditioning and exercises that I was doing. So I was pushed too far to a point of exhaustion, but I wasn't in that same time doing something that was dangerous in terms of how I was doing it. And the other thing is gymnasts are extremely light. They're very you know, lightweight athletes. And so if we fall, take a fall and hurt ourselves, it's probably not anywhere near as dangerous as someone who's a housewife who's had three kids and this is you know, the first time they've ex exercised in 10 years and they're trying to lose their baby weight. And if they fall like that, I mean, I, that's super dangerous. But the other thing, I've broken my neck. It is not, to have that, that is, I mean, sure, like on a certain level, that's the kind of badge of honor. People think you're tough and whatever. But I broke my neck when I was 16, and I was never the same person after that. You know, there's, there, there's, it, it, it was traumatic, not just on a physical level, but on an emotional level. It's scary. It's, um, you, know, you're, you know, it really is a life-threatening kind of injury, not just from a physical standpoint, but from a psychological standpoint. And so that is terrifying to me if he, to say, if you're not willing to have the possibility of breaking your neck, we don't want you. That's scary, but also if people give in, to, if people go for that challenge and go, okay, I'm willing to do that. Like, what else does that then open them up to? What else are they susceptible to to believe in, to buy into, to be willing to do? How you know? I just find that terrifying. You know, Emily, I'm going to bring in the word functionality. <laughs> I began to hear this word in the exercise world, which I'm also a part of. I tend to be a bit obsessive when it comes to exercising. Yeah, me too. Um, I've done many different sports and been pretty good at a lot of them. And um, I have also pushed myself. And what has developed now in, this, in the world of exercise is this idea of functionality. And functionality is a rehabilitative term, meaning you want to develop in your body or recover in your body optimal flexibility and strength. And um, a lot of programs like Egoscu Method and physical therapists will use the term functionality. You want your body to be able to function as it was designed to, not to be hampered because you've developed shortened muscles and uh, different, you know, kinds of abnormalities from, for postural, from postural um, 
situations or bad habits or overweight or injury even because a lot of people do impair themselves on a permanent basis <coughs> just having bad lifestyle habits posture is one of them you'll see people with <clears throat> up stooped uh, bearing even when they stand and walk and their head is tilted forward down and that's from sitting at the computer I saw this in a very young woman at the pool the other day and I said She's got a head that's lowered and it's going to be always lowered and that's going to cause all kinds of problems in her back in a due time, you know. So CrossFit wants to teach and develop functionality in its members, but this would be an optimal state of functionality. And you push for this optimal functionality so hard that you might even lose control of your bladder while you're in the gym doing squats. And they approve of this, Yeah, the members and the staff. So what I also learned was that CrossFit very generously and thoughtfully um, has developed different kinds of workouts with different levels. For instance, there are workouts for pregnant women, for elderly people, for overweight people, and people who are as fit as Navy SEALs. <laughs> and this is what Glassman said. No SEAL is going to do the fat people's workout, but the fat people will do the SEAL workout. Which is even scary, which is terrifying, I mean, right? I mean, the, the, yeah. one, the one that I went to, there didn't seem to be, like they didn't tell me to come for the beginner's level or the this or whatever. They just told me to come to the five o'clock time. And there was obviously people with varying degrees of fitness there. Um, so yeah, like it seems to me like, you know, Everybody, everybody wants the, the badge of being able to handle that Navy SEAL workout. So there's people who not in a million years ever at their fittest should probably ever be doing that, who are doing that on their second or third day or at the best second or third week. And I just, to me, it's, 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 it's completely crazy. I mean, I think of it as, you know, if I, you know, stepped in as a beginner gymnast in the first week was trying to do things that the girls on the TV were trying to do, like that doesn't, it not only is it dangerous, but it just doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, um, I don't know why somebody running a fitness program would want to do that. I mean, like it, it, it it's, I mean, I'm getting repetitive here, but it's, it's, it's so it's so dangerous, just not only from a physical standpoint, but from a psychological standpoint. And yeah, I was reading that <clears throat> they they consider it a badge of honor if you puke during your workout or if you pee, you know pee in your pants or whatever. And I think I in all the years I did gymnastics when I was two until I was about twenty. I think I maybe threw up once or twice, and it was probably also because I wasn't feeling good that day. Um, so that that's certainly not something necessary to attain, to have had a good workout or to, to be in shape or to become good at something. But if that's what people think that they're shooting for, I mean, I, I just, I, what, what are we even talking about? You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, um, yeah. And I saw that, uh, the uncle Rabdo and they have another uh, character called Pukey the clown. Did you see that one? Yeah. Uncle Rabdo is, also pukey the clown that's another name for him ah, okay um now the apparently the philosophy underlying crossfit is being prepared <coughs> physical preparedness being set up for untested and untried possibilities and glassman says for getting ready for war getting ready for earthquake getting ready for mugging getting ready for the horrible news that you have leukemia and this I don't see computing. How can <laughs> lifting these gigantic weights and um, doing the SEAL workout get you ready for the news that you have leukemia? So this is a total uh, non sequitur, disconnect. It's total, yeah. But the other thing is <laughs> he apparently abhors obesity. And he says that we've got billions of humans pushing into the realm of obesity now. And he claims that CrossFit, this is Glassman, has made people lose 80 million fucking pounds of fat. So there is a, <laughs> that is a wallop to the obese. You know, we got to get rid of all that fat. Well, and so, go, go ahead. ahead. 
what strikes me is his inspiration for this doesn't seem to come from love of the human species and race and wanting to help them. It comes, seems to come from being absolutely revolted by them and wanting to dehumanize them into becoming these just sort of um, Autobots. That's it, Emily. You, you nailed it. It is not from love or kindness or trying to nurture and encourage people to be or, or, and do their best. The thing that I don't understand, and I'd like to get into this briefly and get your take on it, is when I have pushed myself, I have ended up with an injury, and I can feel that injury developing. So I don't know how that barrier is somehow leapfrogged in these CrossFit uh, gyms, because you know you have to look at your anatomy. You've got muscles, striated muscles like biceps and quadriceps and hamstrings and whatnot that do the actual work of lifting your body and pushing it into performance against resistance like weights or water or wherever you happen to be, your own body weight hitting the ground. And then you've got the muscles, at the very end of the muscles are tendons. Tendons are a cartilaginous material that actually grows right into the bone. So tendons are like the beach sand between the water, the ocean, and the land. They are the half this and half that yeah. connection between muscles and bones, because muscles have to be connected to bones. And so they basically grow out of the bones through the tendons. And what happens in my understanding is that when you keep pulling and pushing your body in all directions and you force these muscles that in my body, it's been that connection that breaks down. The tendon will tear and that is a sharp pain. That pain tells you stop this right now. And you do because you don't want it to get worse. And I don't understand how these people bypass those signals because those signals to get your muscles into a state of exhaustion such that they totally fail. They become jelly, and you can't do one more thing with them. I'm surprised that the tendon connection doesn't give out first. Yeah, so, um, wow. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think part of what goes on here is, you know, Sophia, you said you've been very athletic and whatnot, and obviously I have. So we're very in touch with our bodies, and we know when something is wrong. And I think a lot of people who are doing the CrossFit are not necessarily people who have been highly athletic in their life. Sure, you have your Navy SEALs and your ex-athletes who do it, but you know the people that I'm the most concerned about are people who haven't been athletes and don't know anything about proper training and, and proper form and technique. They are not in touch with their body in the same way. And so for them, I think sometimes like they don't, they don't understand the message that your body is trying to send you with specific kinds of pain. And to them, they may just think that you know, okay, it hurts because, uh, you know, it's supposed to hurt. And especially if they're being told as they're working out, the pain is your friend and hurt is it's supposed to hurt. And you're only getting somewhere if it hurts. And, you know, the human mind is a really funny thing. It, it, can, <clears throat> it can override the body. And that is precisely why this is so dangerous. I think that there are people doing their, you know, 90% of their workout in, in, in this case in that condition, you know, the way, when we were pushing ourselves really hard, you know, we basically, first of all, we used very good technique in the things we were doing. We mostly did, you know, isometric and plyometric kind of exercises and mostly used our own body weight in gymnastics. So we would do pull-ups, we would do push-ups, we would do squats and things, but not generally with other weight. Occasionally we would use weights, but we wouldn't so much combine that with a crazy amount of cardiovascular other than maybe we would go from one weight station to the next but we always had a spotter and we were, it was more important to be doing it with proper technique than how many you did it now when we were doing a more circuit training with the calisthenics there you can do a lot of them and it's cardiovascular but you're only using your own body weight and since our focus was on proper technique once the technique was once your technique started to wear down you stopped you didn't keep going and sort of fold into this other technique what i see is with these CrossFit workouts is I don't see people even focusing on form from the very beginning. They're, you, you know, and news to guys, people who are listening, I'm sure people are going to get lots of hate for this, but I do recognize that there are benefits to exercise and this isn't an attack on the people who are involved in this, but 
you guys who, like they're not doing actual pull-ups like a pull-up is like you hang from a dead hang and you pull your chin over the bar the way i notice the crossfit people do pull-ups is they do this herky jerky hip type pull-up which not only is poor technique but also isn't a pull-up so your bragging rights aren't really you know you're using momentum as opposed to strength but they start that way from the beginning and then it gets worse and worse and worse until they're doing something that just is basically flailing around but they're calling a pull-up so you're not doing a pull-up and you're also doing something that's dangerous but the way we would act, when we were conditioning for you know cardiovascular and for building endurance and whatever we would do this kind of circuit training but you, you know we would get to a point where when, when it was time to push past where you could do things you know properly we would just walk or run or do like the cardiovascular portion at that point as opposed to continuing to try and do things that require form and technique and skill to do I see these guys like doing these like squats where they're lifting a huge weight over their head and they're doing it in the middle of all this other stuff they're running around, running around doing. It is so dangerous. Um, and yeah, they don't seem to understand in their body when to stop. For me now, when I'm exercising, if I feel kind of pain that I think is any kind of injury, like I immediately sort of, if I'm running or do whatever, I'll slow down and run and see how it feels and test a little bit. If, it's, if I think there's anything funny going on, I stop. And as far as the way that I push myself, um, I'll go, like I'll run until like I feel like I can't run anymore, then I'll run a teeny bit longer. And then if I want to keep exercising, I'll walk. So I continue the aerobic activity. But once you're walking, you're no longer doing something that is pushing yourself into the danger zone. I do think it's good to push to the limit and then maybe a hair past that, but you have to know your own body. And if there's pain in muscles or bones involved or tendons or anything like that, uh-uh. You need to stop. You need to check that, test it. And it's always, I always err on the side of caution. And if I'm unsure about something, I just stop and walk. Absolutely. Hey, I do the same thing. Walking, walking is a great form of exercise, but it wouldn't be for CrossFit. You know, one of these, I have to say this because somebody sent me a photo from some CrossFit blog and this encapsulate, encapsulates it. It just nails it. Here was a guy. He was doing squats with some very big, heavy weights. Yep. And are you ready? He had his baby strapped to him as well. Yep. And that is the CrossFit parent. I've seen those kinds of pictures. Yeah. I mean, I have um, a friend who is an important person in my life. I don't really speak to you very much anymore, but I care very much about her. And, and, and she knows that. Um, but she's, she's kind of in the whole CrossFit lifestyle. And, and I saw she posted some pictures of her husband in the hospital having two knee surgeries a few weeks ago. So both of his knees, he's like my age, he's like in his early 40s, I think, or maybe younger than me. And he's already having both knees replaced. And then like three days later, she had a picture of herself doing that same squat with the heavy weight above herself kind of thing. And I'm like, just like, is that how he hurt his knees, squatting with the weight above his head like that? Like, you know, you know what I mean? And you can tell that it's just, okay, you know, hurry up and get better with your new knees so you can come back to the gym and do more. But I've seen those things with the babies strapped on before too. And, you know, they have CrossFit classes for kids now, CrossFit competitions for kids. And I was reading one article this morning about a kid who, when they were 13, their family signed them up. And they, they've been doing CrossFit together as a family for eight years. And he was talking about it as like he had, their family had joined a cult. Um, it's it's weird, yeah. Like, I mean, it's 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 scary. I'm going to read from a CrossFit blog. Humility, all caps. Humility, something every CrossFitter should possess. <clears throat> there is no athlete that cannot be brought to his knees by a workout. There is no perfection, only degrees of better. No matter what your achievements, you can also do more and should strive for that. I think they meant you can always do more and should strive for that. See also pride. Yeah, I mean, that's like, what's scary about that is there's a, there, you know, it's kind of like there, there's truth in that statement, but I, I are, the way that they are perceiving things in that environment, it's twisted. Like, you know, as a gymnast, I understood you can always work harder, you can always, you know, perfect 
And that doesn't mean you can always push yourself beyond exhaustion. It means sometimes when you're tired, okay, that's a time to go around and work on your flexibility. Or that's a time to go and clean up your routines and polish up your toe point or, or you work on the choreography of it. It doesn't mean that like, okay, when you're exhausted, you just do it more anyway, better, you know what? But that's how it's being perceived in that environment. There is like, I don't see any um, diversity of uh, thought or opinion on, on how these blanket statements that are part of the mottos of these clubs are being perceived. You know what I mean? Yeah, Emily, you used the word cult just a minute or so ago, and that's a framework for this, I think, that when they indoctrinate you in this way with these mottos and slogans and philosophies, they're really removing your own judgment and your own governance of your own body. And they are putting you in a danger zone because you're no longer connected to yourself. You're following and a, a protocol that doesn't, doesn't fit any individuality. It's just a cross. It's like a cross section, cross fit. It's for everyone. Yeah, it's for, it, it, it was remindful of organized religion and of government, that there's always this other greater thing outside of yourself that is better at making decisions for you than you are for you. And so there's a, you know, a lack of, you know, it's important to push aside your individuality to be part of the group because the, but of course there's always an individual on top of the group in this case Glassman who knows best what is best for you. And that it's, he almost becomes the intermediary between you and God, the way government does, puts itself between people and wherever they think they're coming from or wherever they think they should go. And the way religion puts a priest or a pastor or, a, you know, whatever, you kind of have to, you know, get approval there. They, they sort of, you know, design what the flock does and the flock all does that together. And, you know, <clears throat> it's very scary. The things that I notice about it, and this is the reason why I'm comparing it to a cult. In fact, I was very surprised to find that there have been a lot of articles written by people about it being a cult because I hadn't really heard it talked about much. Um, so it's, aside from all the things we've already discussed, there is these, a lot of the people, not all, so I'm, I'm gonna be fair, but a lot of the people, once they go, join in this, it takes over their whole life. They spend mo they, the most, they, it's what they talk about all the time. All their posts on Facebook are about it. I noticed they stop spending time with other friends who have nothing to do with it. And, and their, most of their friend group comes from that they're, you know, the, the CrossFit, the gym that they work out at, most of them eat the same diet, the diet being um, the paleo diet or the caveman diet. So they're all eating that diet, whether or not that's the right diet for their body type or the rest of their health circumstances is irrelevant. They wear these similar outfits, including these ridiculous knee socks that are kind of funny, but so I get the humor in them, but I also understand from looking into the way these things work, that there's an element of almost like mockery. See, we can get you to make yourselves look stupid too, you know? So there's that, they involve their families in them. Um, they spend their weekend, so they're there for their workout time and their recreational time. They go to these competitions on the weekend. You know, it, it, the whole, it, it, it is exactly like people become with their, with their with churches. And I'm not, you know, I'm not denouncing all churches here, whatever. I understand some people keep a balance in their life, but we all know the kinds of cult-like churches, Scientology, certain sects of Mormonism, certain sects of Christianity, where, you know, people only like operate in that culture of their church or the ecosystem of their church and, and everything outside of that is not part of them. Um, these are the things about it that, that give me you know, great concern aside just from the danger of the workout itself. What do you think about that, Sophia? What I'd like to mention is that Glassman, you know, he was a little bit of a surly, um, churlish guy. And when he was doing his own special, this was the cross fitness workout in his garage when he was yeah. a teenager, mixing gymnastics, calisthenics, powerlifting. He then began to do personal training and he tried to work in a couple of gyms and he didn't get along with other people apparently <laughs> and so he posted his workout workouts online and people started to follow them 
he got a nice online following and that enabled him to own his own gym, open and own his gym in 2001. And now we get the <laughs> attention from billionaires. This, uh, this jump, I'm not, I'm not so sure about. How did that happen? He got people like Peter Thiel interested and Meg, whoever her, whatever her name is, uh, the eBay lady. I know you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, and he, these people came and they threw money at him. And that's how this giant CrossFit boom was born. So you, what you've pointed out, Emily, in that it is a form of cult making, um, mind control even, maybe that's, that we'll was there next, so yeah. much money uh, was given to it. Yeah, we'll go there next. Yeah, um, yeah. No, the other there's one other thing that uh, that I wanted to say about the cult likeness of it, and I noticed this with another company at the same time, a company called Herbalife. Um, so when you walk into a CrossFit gym, if you're not already a member, and same with these Herbalife smoothie shops they have all around, which I think is an also a weird kind of cult that I'll get into separately sometime. When you walk in, if you're an unknown, if you're a stranger, everyone turns and looks at you like, um, like you're an invader when you walk in. Like, what are you doing there? You know what I mean? Like, it's intimidating. Now, when I, went out, when I went into the CrossFit gym by myself that time and there was no one there, they were very nice. But just recently, I actually went into a CrossFit gym because um, – one of my job, I work in a restaurant and we were wanting to do some uh, tasting kind of event there, right? Or we said we have healthy food. And when I walked in, there was only a couple of people there, but the, like they looked at me like I was crazy for coming into the gym to talk about them. And that kind of feeling that I have, like, I, I feel like if I were to walk in, like just barge into like a meeting of the Church of Scientology or barge into like a, a church that I had never belonged to, people would look at me like an outsider invading some sort of sacred space. And that was the other thing that I wanted to bring up about the cult-like aspect of it. So yeah, so moving into what you mentioned, so I, of course, you know, I naturally, just from my, my background and where my research has gone, look at the mind control aspects of this. And we all know that when the CIA was experimenting with mind control techniques, they, you know, they sort of, uh, backed and or had people start you know cults like jonestown and you know you can usually find you know three-letter agency involvement in extreme forms of certain religions or different kinds of groups and yeah like for me when i hear peter keel's involved in something um i immediately think of like what is the culture creation mind control surveillance capacity watching you like what are the possibilities there with that? And I didn't even know about the Peter Thiel thing. I'm just, what I noticed as far as mind control stuff goes here, that the rise of CrossFit came at about the same time that we started having people come out and, and this sort of almost cult-like following of super soldiers. Like we've had, you know, I think really good, honest testimony from whistleblowers from MK Ultra programs, people like Duncan O'Finian and whatnot, and then a little later came this sort of like super soldier thing where they were having, Dad, stop it. So, excuse me. These, you know, super soldier uh, conferences and people developing followings. And it was almost like this romanticization of um, extra human kinds of, or perceived extra human kinds of uh, performance qualities and abilities and whatnot. And that happened at about the same time this CrossFit thing happened. And think about it. If you want people to not only accept the idea of super soldiers, but like romanticize it, worship it, and want to be that, CrossFit fits in perfectly with that. Yeah, I can't argue. I hadn't thought of it in those terms. I mean, I hadn't really looked at it beyond <coughs> a new workout phenomenon with very strange underpinnings, but that's definitely possible. And this roboticization mm -hmm. of the mind of people, making, in, making them into obedient. This is what CrossFit is about. You know, do 500 push-ups. Well, they'll be obedient and they'll do them. 
And you don't even have to push them that hard because they want to do them because they don't want to be the only one not doing them. You know what else this makes me think of? This makes me think of priming a population to accept the draft again. Yeah, that could be too. You know, like, or, or, or you wouldn't even have to have a draft. If, if, it, if, if people, I mean, think about it. These people want to work out so badly with Navy SEALs and whatnot. And th there's a lot of people who love that. You know, they, maybe they don't love, they don't understand anything about the politics of war or anything about the true human cost of it. But they love the idea of being seen as like a total badass. You know what I mean? Of someone who can just sort of walk into any situation and come out alive. And what you said a while back was that <clears throat> the Glassman was saying that this is preparation for, you know, survival of, of war, of earthquakes or whatever. Like, you know, is this how they're, you know, we obviously in the realm, in the world that you and I uh, sort of dabble in here, we're always hearing about how, you know, there's going to be some Armageddon kind of apocalyptic thing or whatever, right? So is this some kind of like, like survivalist with fitness kind of thing and they're making it so like these are the only people we're going to want when the world becomes harsh is it like a way of trying to you know, and, and i'm not even saying that they're the most fit or or appropriate people to deal with that situation but they'll think they are and they'll be the, the easiest group of people to mind control when some if something like that ever happens they don't want someone like you or I who may be fit and may have a lot of <clears throat> both intellectual and physical and emotional resources to draw on in an emergency situation because you and I are impossible to control. You want people who are going to do what you say that you can funnel and herd into <clears throat> a system of control. And I can't really, and, and, and not only that, it works best if they think they're having fun. So if they're doing, if they're performing military tasks, but think that they're doing something that's social and fun, they're not even going to protest. You know what, Emily? I just thought of something, which is this. Um, I once knew, I live in San Diego, so there's a lot of SEAL activity that goes on here. Yeah. And I knew a Navy SEAL, and he was mad because he said, we don't do anything except train, and I'm sick of training. I want to go and do something. I want to be on assignment. And apparently there was, he either wasn't in the special group that was being assigned, but he was sick of running through the waves with a backpack and doing these training exercises that they made them do all the time. So he quit. He became a carpenter. And um, I believe that what they're doing with these CrossFit people is they're creating a mindset that is going to welcome Armageddon because they're going to think that they're the only ones that are prepared for it. Yeah. And they're going to embrace it. When the shit hits the fan, I'm sorry, I'm swearing on this show. No, it's fine. But they will, they will, relish that thought they will relish the thought of societal chaos and infrastructure breakdown because this is what they've been prepared for this then they're the only ones that they will think they're the only ones that are going to be able to deal with this so they'll be excited they're gonna i think they're even gonna think that this is fun this is what we've been training for this is our adventure you know what i mean this is their this is our bonding experience or you know what i mean or yeah i i i think you could march them right into a sort of very 21st century, century style war and have them not even realize that that's what they're in because they would think, oh, this is just the army. You know, they, this is what they've been preparing for. They don't understand anything about the underlying meaning of it or whatever. It's just the survivalist part of that. And I actually feel like they'd enjoy it. It's very, it's very weird. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and, but just survive it. You know what I mean? Like, I think if, if let, God forbid, you, any of us be thrown into that situation. I think if you or I were thrown into that situation, I'll speak for myself, we understand what was happening and we have, you know, from the things that we've looked into and the things we've studied and the way we live our life, we've prepared ourselves for something like that. But what we're looking for is not just to survive it so we can be controlled again by a, by a power outside of ourselves, but okay, we need to figure out a way through this awful thing to find a better way forward and to, you know, create a new reality that doesn't involve any of this stuff, not relish the fact that we were the only ones to be able to survive that one. So let's do it again. Right. That's exactly it. 
And it's possible that, you know, we're only at the beginning of this CrossFit wave. Mm -hmm. It's possible that the way they're doing with transgender people, that yeah. CrossFit people are going to be showcased and highlighted and trotted and paraded in front of us as heroes. Mm -hmm. And that we're going to look up to CrossFit people. And presidents of corporations will be CrossFit people, you know, and politicians will be CrossFit people yeah. and school principals, CrossFit people, and everybody will look up to CrossFit people. And when we get into the Armageddon stage of things, the CrossFit people will lead us all and who yeah. knows what they're really being groomed for. And, you know, I wanted to mention a few uh, weeks ago, I had a conversation, which was very interesting to me, a guy who was a um, heavy metal uh, I'll just call it musician. Yeah. He started in his garage playing heavy metal when he was maybe 13 with other kids from the neighborhood. And they had um, some satanic uh, touches, you could call it, um, in their uh, in the clothes they wore and the way that they, the music they played. And they were the lower bottom ranks of dupes in a cult uh, kind of setting and he told me that when you start out you are a dupe and then from the ranks of dupes they cull the adepts yep so for instance in this music world there will be tons of kids who have pentagrams on their drum kits and they wear the black sneakers and the black pants and they play heavy metal music and dark um kind of I don't know, they interested in this kind of darkness. And, but they will not end up being Satanists for the rest of their life. They're not even real Satanists. They're just doing it because it's cool. And, but then from their midst um, will be pulled the adepts. And as you go higher and higher on the pyramid of experience, there will be the real Satanists um, tra trawling the ranks of the dupes for people who could be made into adepts and you'll be invited to ceremonies and the ceremonies will get increasingly more intense. Yeah. Um, maybe you'll mangle a doll in one of them, but then from that ceremony, another ceremony will be created at a higher level and there will be blood drinking and only the, the participants will be smaller and smaller at each higher level of intensity that you get to. And eventually if you make it through all those ranks of ceremonies and test testings, you'll end up as an adept. And I think this might be what's ha what will happen with CrossFit too, that they will take from the dupes, the people who attend all these gyms and do these group workouts, um, people who can ascend into the higher levels and be the future leaders of our society be and be thoroughly mind controlled. Yeah, so absolutely. A couple of, you said a bunch of stuff there. First, I want to go back to what you said about how the CrossFit people like will be heroes like the transgender people. I just thought of this. CrossFit would be a perfect environment for them to push certain aspects of transhumanism because if people are in, damaging their bodies and they can have parts replaced with some sort of technological version that won't break down that way, They'll accept that. Not only will they accept that, they'll like that, right? Like, yes, they would even all probably be open to having something in their body that could constantly monitor how their heart rate, their fitness steps, their how, how many miles they've gone, how much energy they've exerted, how much calories they burn, how much they've taken in, and they think it's for themselves, but really it's also being you know monitors from the central uh, you know central control system, you know so. CrossFit, I mean, is this about crossing into, using fitness to cross into transhumanism? I think that's a possibility. And then the other thing you said, you know, I, I always, you know, as soon as you brought up Palantir, I, I, uh, Peter Thiel, I started thinking of Palantir. I would, not only am I wondering, but I'd be willing to wager a small bet that if he's invested in these CrossFit gyms, then that they're running Palantir software through them. Do you know what Palantir software is, Sophia? No. So you know what Promise software is, don't you? Yes, I've okay. heard of that. So Palantir is like the newer updated version of it. And it's basically a way of keeping track of people you're following, your assets, your agents, 
you can, you know, um, what they're doing, it's basically a way of keeping track of people and seeing how things, you know, where certain crossovers happen. It's a very updated, it's the 21st century or the, the more modern version of Promise. Um, George Webb, I'm sure you're familiar with his videos. He's done some talking about Palantir and that how it's used to um, track and monitor, you know, agents and or just even people that they're following with the hopes of of turning or using as uh, victims to organ harvest or, or what using as sex slaves or whatever. It's basically a tracking technology. And if you think about it, even though they're not the, the CrossFit gym is they don't call them franchises, they're affiliates, which leads me to believe that they're all still part of a central hub. And if Peter Thiel is invested in that, I mean, think about how quickly these gyms open and where they go up and there's one in every neighborhood. And how is this you know, possible so quickly without major financing behind it, aside from just the people who are putting in some of their own money to open one of these branches? There, what a great, you know, Peter Thiel could be, what, what, you know, when we're playing what if here. So, you know, I'm not saying this is what's happening, but this is just where my mind goes. I mean, it would be a reason why he'd want to be invested in someone like this, track these people through their work. See, I mean, who is a great candidate to be mind controlled? Who is a great candidate to be super soldierized? Who is a great candidate to be willing to offer their children up into a program that would promise to turn them into a superhuman soldier? Yep, that's very possible as well. I mean, we're running the what if software in, in ourselves right now. <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking about the integration of um, transhumanism into this and the failure of certain body parts and, you know, getting, I was thinking you were going to say that people will want to have titanium yeah. and Teflon and carbon and all this super material yeah. in their bodies because then they'll be able to lift ad infinitum, right? Sure. That, th sure. Have those things put in, you know, either when they get injured or even forget about waiting till you get injured. Somebody who got injured and had to have and got a steel leg instead, he can do way more. So I want the steel leg, kind of like, you know, Angelina Jolie preemptively taking off her breasts, right? Like, kind of like that kind of thing. People preemptively replacing body parts. You know, they do that in baseball too. They, the kids want to have Tommy John surgery, even if they don't need it because it makes it strengthens your shoulders so you can be a better pitcher, like a, a thing like that. So I was talking about that, but then I immediately moved into, well, they can even convince these people to have a device in their body to monitor all of their, their activity and their fitness. So they know exactly how fit they are and how many breaths they've taken that day and how all that kind of, so both, you know, both, you know, robotized or, or technological body parts, but then also a central sort of control system in their body, you know, almost like having a Fitbit that's inside of your body. So you don't have to wear it and you don't have to hook it up to a computer. It's just always there. And, you know, through Bluetooth or some other remote connection to computers, you can constantly be downloading the information for yourself. But of course, someone else would be downloading it too. Yes, Emily, very spot on. Yeah, I, I, I just, you know, so the, the reason I, I, I didn't make it clear, Peter Thiel owns Palantir software. He cre I don't know if he created it, but he owns Palantir software, in addition to PayPal and all of these. I mean, think about also the way you could cross-reference what people buy with how they work out. So there, you know, I mean, there's just a million things that, a million reasons why he would be interested in following the activities of different pods of a quote-unquote, you know, cult-like kind of phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, the money in CrossFit is gargantuan. They've won every lawsuit, every lawsuit. They brag about it. I, I, 80 I, lawyers. Yeah. Why, if you were doing something so safe and wonderful and for the benefit of humanity, why do you need 80 lawyers on staff all the time? Well, it's not safe. They know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, uh, that's the admission to me, right? That, yeah, you know what I mean? So they'll say it's, I mean, they say it's safe. They obviously know it's not. They get very defensive, you know, and, you know, I was reading a lot of articles and a lot of the comment sections of articles and people defending their CrossFit pods, saying that they've been to other gyms where it's um, dangerous, but if there's, there's good technique and, you know, lots of back and forth, but and there's even some people who are part of it that, that recognize that it's cult-like, but they continue anyway. And I'd say you see that same thing, Scientology, 
other things like that, that when there becomes the, you know, there, there's even people who recognize what it is, but continue on anyway. Um, very interesting. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, I, my mind just can go in a million places on what the, what the possible outcomes of this are. Is this a grand experiment or is this the result of some experiment? You know what I mean? Are they waiting to see what happens with these people? Or is this the result of something that they already knew and they've sort of put it into action? You know, it's, a, it's always, it's a figure like Glassman that they look for to, <clears throat> to do these kinds of things. You know what I mean? It's like a, like a, like a Zuckerberg. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. again, you know, Glassman's father worked at Rocket Dine, I believe. He was a rocket scientist. Of course. Uh, of course. OK. So then that that's another, you, you know, I think you and I spoke about this when we spoke privately a few weeks ago. Um, where I live, where, where I grew up is basically backed up right against Rockadine. You know what I mean? And so he must be from a very same area that I'm from. So I'm sure we cross paths in this. It's very interesting. You know, people, um, I, you know, is this, I firmly believe that, that companies like Rockadine, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, they're, you know, partners with governmental agencies and other corporations in MK Ultra type programs and the sub projects that, that fall beneath that umbrella and the technologies that are being used in those programs, both to, you know, enhance, to, you know, facilitate certain sort of simulations of things to enhance abilities, but also to track, trace, and monitor the subjects. You know, these are connections that the average person would miss because the way, if you Google Greg Glassman and how he became a fitness guru from being a polio victim as a child and using a walker, you would think it was a tremendous survival success story. But when you know a little bit more about the way the world works and you yeah. remember or you realize that his father worked in defense and that defense relates to surveillance and to get a gym going, where, which is the fastest growing, exploding a phenomenon in the country where more and more members want to sign up and they're building, as he says, CrossFit is designed to build your will. Well, will is not far from uh, mind control, really. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that, that the agencies that work on these kinds of mind control pro uh, programs and high level athletics, they share, they, they trade techniques with each other. Like when I look at <clears throat> high level athletic training and then look at some of the <clears throat> training in those kinds of programs, I wonder, are the programs getting their ideas from the athletes or the, vice versa? Or is it all really one big thing? You know what I mean? Is it, is, are all of these, you know, and I've been thinking about this more and more and talking about this with people, you know, with this whole Pizzagate thing going on, this level of pedophilia, corruption, surveillance, control, monitoring, um, invasion of people, of human beings, um, thought space, uh, entry into their dream space, um, entry into their bodies, this, by the time we, you know, unravel this whole thing, there isn't going to be any, any institution that is known and loved by the public that isn't involved in it. It's everywhere. It's part of everything. It isn't that like, oh, sports have nothing to do with this or, you know, <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's in regard people spying on people's knitting clubs, right? So, <clears throat> Of course, you can take it out. If you can take it out that far, then of course, something having to do with physical performance, of course, that's invaded. Of course, these, you know, I mean, you go to the YMCA and the rooms, like exercise rooms at the YMCA, have plaques outside of them saying that they were donated by Raytheon. In some case, I saw that I was at the YMCA in Boston and like this, this room, you know, uh, we th you know, we thank Raytheon for the donation of, you know, to build this room or whatever. So it's everywhere. Like, what, why does that have, to, you know, like, wh why is that? Why do we, you know, why, why, why does, and just, you know, maybe we can get into this. We're going to take a break in just a second. When we come back, maybe we can get into how you sort of outlined some of this with your um, newsletter about the quote unquote club. Why is it that the 
why is there a connection between these gentlemen clubs and the military contractors? Or why are those military contractors always donating to organizations for little kids and so sponsoring the baseball team and stuff like that? Why do we have to have this mixture of everything? It isn't just for do-gooder stuff because those people are not do-gooder. There's something else going on there. What do you think? I think you're right. It's not for corporate image purposes. Yeah, no. That's just the glossy veneer. Okay, so we're going to take a break for just a second. And when we come back, uh, we'll move over to uh, the website for the second hour of the show. <clears throat> and um, we'll be back in just a minute. I'm with Sophia Smallstorm. We've been talking the cult of CrossFit. <clears throat> and we're going to get into the club and MKL to athletes when we return. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. 